Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What's On My Desk. Today I'm going to talk about some bang for your buck with Diego La Culture, as well as a big on Vacheron and Constantine, a brand that's part of the Holy Trinity, as most would say, as well as another throwback from Hanarai. Let's start the episode with the Panerai Mare Nostrum PAM603. An enormously huge watch at 52 millimeters, this time done in titanium. And I say this time done is because this is more or less the same thing they did back in 2010. Uh, when they did the PAM 300, which probably means they should have made this watch PAM 600. I don't know why it's a 603. The PAM 300 back in 2010 was done in stainless steel. And it's seemingly the same watch with the exception of uh, the PAM 300. And Ian popped that up on the screen was done in a stainless steel. It had a green strap. It had more of a military look where this with the tobacco brown dial, the sort of vintage looking strap uh, makes it more of a vintage look. Uh, it's still a very military looking watch, don't get me wrong, but uh, nevertheless, more of a vintage look with this one. And unfortunately, they hid the beautiful Minerva movement that they use in this watch by giving it a solid back. I don't know why they would do that. It makes no sense. The, its steel predecessor uh, had uh, the open back that you could see the movement in it. It's no secret that Panerai has a lot of historic ties with the Italian Royal Navy. Back in 43, they created the first prototype, the Mare Nostrum uh, for the Italian Navy. And uh, they have a pretty extensive catalog to go back to, uh, which means they can do a lot of throwbacks or remakes, whatever you want to call them. And 2010 Panerai was still hot, even post-crisis. 2015 Panerai has already kind of cooled off, but there was still room in the market to make these re-editions uh, of the originals, which true Panaristi collectors go ape for. They decided to do just that. The only issue I see with this watch is the fact that they made 150 pieces. I think it's way too many. And the biggest reason it's way too many is not that 150 piece limited edition is a huge edition. It's actually not, you know. Most manufacturers out there like AP will get out there and they'll make a limited edition of 500 or 300 or even 1,000, right? And sometimes they'll make a trilogy where it's uh, 1,500 and 100, depending on the metal, right? The biggest issue I have with this watch, uh, rather than telling you, I will show you. It's a 52 millimeter behemoth. And by the way, just because this thing is made in titanium versus a steel counterpart, it's still not light. Who can wear this? That's a huge bitch. The lugs are literally protruding outside my, my, my wrist. So there's not a lot of guys out there that can pull off a 52 millimeter watch, number one. Number two, even for those that can pull it off, I'm not so sure that would reach for a 52 millimeter watch. Panerai has always thrived on the fact that they made bigger watches and you know, the trend has been bigger, 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 right? But I think at 52 millimeters, you now kind of gone overboard and I'm not so sure there were 150 guys out there that would want to pick this up. Of course, when these came out, like any other limited editions, they were trading through the roof. If you Google the reference number and you read some of the blog posts on the 300 and the 603, all the bloggers were predicting these things are gonna go up in value because it's a short limited edition. Lo and behold, it's not. Watch got a hefty retail, it's like 40,900 or something like that, around 41,000. And today you can buy this watch brand new still, believe it or not, up which is 30, maybe even 35% off retail because again, um, not an easy watch to wear. The Panerai hype has kind of died down in general, right? From a personal perspective, I love everything about this watch. I love the fact that it's a military looking watch. I love the fact that it's a vintage watch. Would I want the original? Absolutely, I would want the original. But those are not that easy to come by. So uh, this is probably your second best bet. And I would go with this guy over the first 300 just because uh, it is slightly lighter because it's in titanium. I like the chocolate brown dial. Again, it sort of gives me the military, yet more of a vintage look overall as far as this watch is concerned. And last but not least, I'll be very honest with you. If I had the wrist to pull this off, I would definitely wear this watch because just a hell of a looking watch, if you ask me. Uh, moving on to Jaeger. Now, I did an entire episode on the, on the history of Jaeger La Culture Reversa, if you guys remember. For those that haven't watched it, check that out because I feel that the Jaeger La Culture Reversa, not only an iconic watch for Jaeger, I feel that it's an iconic watch for the watch world overall. To go back to the 30s and consider the world where we're living in, the Reversa was certainly a revolutionary watch. The Reversa was certainly something that is indeed, in my book, top 10 iconic models out there regardless of brand. So what did I bring with me? I brought a Reverso Chronograph Power Reserve on a gold bracelet. And this goes back to me saying that this is a lot of bang for your dollar. So on the one side, you have your time and date. Obviously you have your, your pushers on the side. If I flip the watch over, you'll notice the chronograph 
counters, and they are retrograde chronograph counters here, which, which makes them more complex than your standard chronograph. Yellow gold with a yellow gold bracelet. This model is long discontinued. A watch that retailed originally for 39 and change, around $40,000, and you can pick these watches up today in low teens. So ask yourself a question, how many watches out there can you pick up? Again, all gold on a gold bracelet in the low teens. It's not a whole lot of options out there. So if you're someone that doesn't care what anybody says, if you're someone that buys what they like first and foremost, that are into history, this is certainly a great watch for you, if you ask me, and for me as well. I, I like the way this watch sits on a wrist too. It's a great fit. I love the way they integrated the bracelet into the case where it sort of hugs your wrist. Whether you have a small wrist or a big wrist, the effect will be the same. And this is what I meant in the beginning when I said a lot of bang for your dollar because this watch certainly is one of those watches today. As they say, save the best for last. Last but not least, I have a Vacheron Constantine a Royal Eagle in stainless steel on a stainless steel bracelet. Now, you often hear of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Three, top three brands, blah, 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 and Vacheron is often mentioned to be the three of them. Now, there's nothing set in stone that, uh, you know, the Holy Trilogy is this, uh, but it is commonly known that Vacheron is part of the Holy Three. I'm not gonna get into giving you an entire history of Vacheron Constantine, but I'll briefly tell you this. Uh, there's a reason why most people consider Vacheron to be part of the Holy Trinity. Let's start with the fact that this is the longest uninterruptedly running com watch company out there, born in 1755, and they continuously ran from then all the way up to today. While I guess the one milestone worth mentioning is 96, they were acquired by the Richmond Group, but they didn't stop them. So in reality, they've been continuously running now for how long? 265 years? That's a hell of a feat, if you ask me. Why else is the Vacheron part of the Holy Trinity? Let's look at some of their achievements. Let's start with the notables. Queen Elizabeth, the Pope, Marlon Brando, the Wright brothers. I wonder if they actually flew wearing a Vacheron when they were trying to create the first airplane. Princess Diana, John D. Rockefeller, Napoleon Bonaparte just to mention a few big names. And I'm gonna omit uh, mentioning probably what's most notable, King Faoud I of Egypt, and I'll tell you why later, because next I wanna move on to some of the achievements that this company has made. 1790, first world complication. 1824, that brought us the Jump Hour watch. Late 1800s, the first non-magnetic piece, right? And it was in 1929 where they created the world's most complicated watch, the Grand Complication Pocket Watch for King Faoud of Egypt, which later in uh, 2004 or five fetched $2.8 million in auction. I think Antiquorum sold that pocket watch for 2.7 something million dollars, right? Not bad. Let's talk about thin watches. 1955, they created Caliber 1003, which was the world's thinnest manual wine watch, and it's held that record for a long time. I think recently it was the Bulgari Octo that beat them. I think I talked about that in one of my episodes, right? And then 40-some years later, in the 90s, they came up with the world's thinnest minute repeater, which was the Caliber 1755, oddly, you know, the year that they were born. I don't think that was an incident. I think it was purposely uh, numbered that year because it was a big feat. The minute repeater is a complicated watch to make, and then to make it so thin is a, it's a hell of a feat, if you ask me. And then in 2015, they showed everybody how big badass Vacheron is, and they made the world's uh, most complicated pocket watch, which consisted of 57 complications. So that, more or less, to me, anyway, answers the question why Vacheron Constantine is part of the Holy Trinity. But I want to talk to you about this watch because I think this is definitely a sleeper. So the Royal Eagle, right? They came out in, uh, well, let me show you the watch first. Royal Eagle chronograph on a bracelet, white dial. There were a few variations. They made this watch in gold. They made this watch on a strap. They made it with a black dial. But the example I have here is white dial steel on a bracelet. Came out in 2001, and this was a short-lived watch. Uh, this was discontinued in 2008, and it was replaced by the Malta chronograph, which basically took this to no shape watch, which is a decent size. It's 48 this way and 37 millimeter this way, and they sort of made it shorter and fatter kind of going back to more of a traditional, somewhat of a more round shape than this particular watch was, right? Again, designed in uh, good old Art Deco style, you know, in the likes of Frank Mueller did the same thing with his Tenno shaped watches. That's what this was designed. Why is this watch important? Because this is the first real true sports watch that Vacheron Constant actually made. Up until then, you know, Vacheron Constant's models all resembled you know, their traditional 
uh, dressy, I guess I could call them, uh, watches that they made in the 50s and the 60s. And this was the first. This was the first true sports watch that Vacheron has ever made. The fact that this watch was so short-lived, to me, makes this watch a sleeper because these watches are still out there available under $10,000. And I see you guys collecting Pepsi GMTs, which they made millions of at this point. Paddock Nautilus is not overlooking something that is so obvious, yet still affordable. Uh, I think this watch is definitely a sleeper. I tell you guys, watches are not an investment, so I'm gonna call this watch a wise buy because again, I tell you all these things are expensive toy, but if you take into consideration uh, history of Ashram, the fact that indeed this watch deserves to be part of the holy trinity, blah, 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 right? And then at the end of the day, this is actually a really good looking watch that also sits well on the wrist, let me show you. As a true watch connoisseur, how do you not get out there and pick one of these up and add it to your collection and forget about it for 20, 30 years? Uh, I wish I had a glass ball. If I had to make a friendly wager, I would say that eventually this is gonna be a watch that people will wake up and say, oh my God, this is an iconic timepiece from Vacheron. This is an iconic timepiece from one of the most iconic companies out there. Well, why is this watch not going through the roof? But for now, original retail on this watch, I think was around $17,000 and they're trading around that half price mark complete. So that's it. That's, uh, that's my uh, shortened version uh, down memory lane of Vacheron Constantine. As far as bang for your dollar, uh, if you're someone that uh, has been coveting a limited edition Mario Nostrum back in the day when it was trading over its retail value, today is the day you can get out there, buy what you like, and actually get it at a discount. A big gold watch, you know, which is again an iconic timepiece, a reversal from Jaeger in the low teens, which, you know, there's not a whole lot out there for that kind of money. And then a sleeper from Vacheron Constantine, I think is a future icon and certainly is a lot of bang for your dollar considering the price that they're trading at now. So guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, I, uh, I try to do my best to show you guys variety. What's on my desk is gonna be almost two years old soon. You know, it's not easy to continuously come up with different content and different ideas. So I'm gonna ask you guys for some help. But the biggest issue with asking you for help is that you ask me, oh, well, can you show me this watch? Or can you show me that watch? And of course, what I can show you really depends on what's in stock and we're a company that doesn't collect these watches. We actually actively sell them. Oftentimes, by the time these episodes air, some of the stuff that I show is already sold. But do give me some general ideas for what's on my desk. I don't want this particular series to get stale. It's near and dear to my heart. It's what started my YouTube channel. This, the what's on my desk gave birth to Q&A, gave birth to all the collabs and the blogs and things of that nature. This is what kept my channel going in the very, very beginning. And this is how I found all of you guys. So, but do throw some ideas my way in regards to what's on my desk. I do want to try to do some different things on here as I don't want these episodes to get stale. And as always, comment any questions below, which I'll try to answer on Q&A. Other than that, I'll see you guys next week for more watch reviews and other videos.